Hi, I'm Kevin McNamara, and thank you for joining us between these two synthetic ferns. I'm the founder and CEO of Parallel Domain, a synthetic data generation platform, and I'm here today with Adrian Gaydon from Toyota Research Institute, where he's the head of machine learning research. Adrian, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, Kevin. Uh, thanks. It's a pleasure to be here with you. And so, yeah, my name is uh, Adrian Gaddon, and I work at the uh, Toyota Research Institute, uh, TRI, here in California, where I lead the machine learning research team, where we're studying how to scale up uh, machine learning for autonomy uh, for future Toyota products like self-driving cars or robots. And so we've been doing a lot of work on uh, synthetic data uh, for deep learning uh, since 2014. Um, and in particular, I did one of the first photorealistic uh, uh, video data sets, uh, synthetic data sets for multi-object tracking uh, at CPR 2016. Uh, that's called, called Virtual Kitty? Yeah, right? Virtual Kitty, that's correct. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and since then, we've done a lot of work on self-supervised learning, domain adaptation, simulation for deep learning uh, for safety uh, critical applications. And um, yeah, glad to be here. Great, and, and, and that uh, segues nicely into how we've been working with your team. Uh, Parallel Domain's been working with TRI probably for the past three years now, mm -hmm. uh, enabling a lot of your research and, and model development using our synthetic data, using our synthetic data platform. Uh, and our mission as a company at Parallel Domain is to help accelerate this development of computer vision and perception using synthetic data. Uh, and really, at the end of the day, we want to help train machines to see the world better so that they can help us live more productive and safer lives. And, and, and we believe that this, you know, we're going to talk about today, this, this evolution in synthetic data actually allows us to more quickly generate training and testing data for deploying models out into the real world that actually beat state-of-the-art performance relative to what we'd be able to do with just real-world data alone. So I think one of the first questions I'd love to jump into is, you know, how have you seen the advantages of synthetic data in your re research enable you to either train better models or move more quickly when, when deploying new model types? Right, um, that's a great question. So first, um, there's basically like three big advantages to synthetic data for us. Um, first, uh, safety, always safety first. Um, generating synthetic data is doesn't require you to go out in the world and maybe do risky things. Um, and two big advantages uh, also are it's programmable and it's fast. Mm -hmm. And so one of the uh, core problem with uh, robotics application like self-driving cars, etc., cetera, is, uh, is there are physical applications of machine learning. Um, they're embodied systems. So if you say, I want some data, either you don't control the data generation process, the data collection process, it comes from your fleet, so you don't control the sensors, you don't control how people are, how the, where the robots are going into the world. Um, so you have a lot of historical data, which might not be the data you want or you need. And so having access to a programmable data engine, uh, like what you get from simulators, so synthetic data set generation APIs, enables you to really just engineer the data set which is this big part that we don't know how to do in machine learning, is like typically we work with fixed data sets or fixed public benchmarks and where you're optimizing a clear metric and everything as well. Um, but for a lot of the research we're doing, a lot of the uh, cutting edge future products like self-driving cars and robots, we don't really know what data we need. And so as it's very expensive to build robots and collect data in the real world, uh, it's much better to uh, and much faster to try to generate data and find out like the engineering principles behind mm -hmm. data set generation. And that's also the, the second benefit, right? It's much faster. So we can really iterate very quickly um, and program uh, the data set and the data pipeline, uh, which typically takes a lot of effort with real-world data pipelines. It's, it's a great example of, of why at Parallel Domain we're so focused on the synthetic data problem is because you know, collecting and labeling this data in the real world is such a time-consuming and cumbersome, expensive and kind of inaccurate process. And like you said, at the end of the day, you end up with the data that you encountered and collected in the real world, not necessarily the data that you would have programmed if you had that opportunity. Yeah, right? And it's not even labeled, right? So that's the thing, is mm -hmm. that that's the dirty little secret in machine learning, which is it's supervised learning. Everything you see in a product that actually needs to work in machine learning is supervised. And, and that's obviously not scalable. It's supervised by humans, really. Yeah, it's manually means, yeah. labeled, exactly. And for certain tasks, it's very costly, very time consuming. And for some tasks, it's not even possible. There are certain modalities, like uh, if you want to estimate the depth from single images, or if you want to estimate how things move, like, like optical flow at a very precise level, 
you can't even get that at all from historical data. So simulation is sometimes the only way to go. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, with that, a couple of examples there, and we're going to touch on some research papers that your team has published, you know, proving how you can use the synthetic data to train better models. But I think a lot of folks who are, who are watching are probably going to have that question of like, that sounds great, but does it really work? And so I'd love to hear from you, especially in your experience, like does synthetic data work and can you train better machine learning models for real world deployment using that? Yeah, so the answer is definitely yes. I mean, there's been tremendous progress. Um, just recently, I was having a meeting with our university collaborators at Berkeley, a uh, very famous computer vision professor, Alyosha Efros, mm -hmm. and we were talking about um, some results that we were having. And at the beginning of the slides, we had some example synthetic clips from Parallel Domain because we've been using it for our research. And it was just at the end of the presentation where Alyosha said, wait, can we go back to the first slide? Is that synthetic data? And, mm -hmm. and that was like kind of like, I was like, oh, Kevin's going to love this. Yeah, uh, you're right. <laughs> I do love that. And so, and so there's been tremendous progress. Um, and if some people have not necessarily seen the latest and greatest in terms of photorealistic rendering, it's kind of mind blowing. Yeah. And there's three big areas where things are, I'm really excited about using it. Um, there's how, like some cases, as I mentioned, where you don't have real data at all. Some cases where um, you need to bootstrap very quickly from zero to one. And some cases where you need to, like you're basically in this stationary regime of like you have your data pipeline you have your models it's deployed but you need to improve and especially for the long tail and that's one of the big challenges of machine learning which is the world is non-stationary it changes all the time new things happen like scooters in san francisco etc mm -hmm. etc and so you constantly have to adapt your your machine learning models which means you constantly need to generate labeled data new labeled samples and boost uh, some of the more rare classes you know like uh, ethics and fairness in machine learning is another big challenge and sometimes you cannot collect that data or not enough or not representative enough and so those are the three big areas some areas where you cannot get real data like accidents unethical uh, cases mm -hmm. where you need to be robust to that but you can't collect the data also maybe for privacy reasons zero to one how do you quickly bootstrap a data pipeline how you get your first model out of the door without having to build a fleet of robots and like like machine, data comes first. So how do you get quickly data first in place and then boosting the long tail? Those yeah. are like three big uh, applications. Yeah, that's a great way to encapsulate it too because in some senses that does cover most of the machine learning life cycle, right? Exactly. And, and what I love about that is it, it shows how we can use synthetic data to both accelerate uh, and, and make more practical and efficient almost every stage of that life cycle, as long as we're smart about how we're using mm -hmm. some combination of real and synthetic to get Absolutely. together. So that, yeah, that's fantastic. And you know, some examples that you mentioned there, you know, emergency vehicles, pedestrians at night, bicyclists riding in the mm -hmm. road, these are all cases that we think about and encounter as humans on a pretty regular basis. But then you start to think, do I encounter enough ambulances with their lights on at nighttime in, in my regular driving patterns to, to actually train a machine learning model to recognize the cases? And the answer is certainly not, right? You probably need hundreds of thousands, if not millions of those examples. Um, and then that's where synthetic data can step in because you're just never going to be right. able to capture um, the, the volume of, of these scenarios that you Yeah, need. you have a combinatorial yeah. explosion, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's, you know, there is this set of unknowns. There's the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. The unknown unknowns is really hard and you need to have your models deployed in the world and take a long time to surface that. But you get to that once you have a system in place first. You don't just deploy a system and wait and see, oh, the system crashed, great, uh, I learned something. I mean, when you do this with a safety critical system, like a self-driving car, you cannot A-B test something that is not safe on mm -hmm. the public roads. Mm -hmm. So you need to first have a very solid system in place, which means you need to kind of have a very good handle on the known unknowns. And as you said yourself, the known unknowns, there is like all these combination of factors like weather, like time of day, like behavior of the, of the agents, uh, location, like any kind of crazy things you can imagine. And all these parameters, it creates an, like a, literally a combinatorial explosion of possibilities. And so there's so much known unknowns you can cover with procedural generation. That's, that's, that's what's great about it. I love that you're centering on the known unknowns because we do get a lot of questions where people say, well, how could you ever generate data that you, you've never encountered. You can't think of every possible case. And, and our response is similar to what you said. It's actually not our mission right now, especially. 
Our mission is to cover the cases that we know happen, and we know they happen all the time, they just don't happen enough for us to have a machine learning scale yep. of data to, to train for them. So that, that's a great, uh, great example. So I, I would love to segue a little bit into you know, specific results and, and, and cases sure. where you've been able to use synthetic data to, to demonstrate really state-of-the-art performance with machine learning models. And I think um, today we're going to focus primarily on two papers that, mm -hmm. that your team has published. Um, but then later on, we're also going to talk about our vision for the future and, and how mm -hmm. can this actually change the way machine learning teams work with, with data going forward. Um, but the first we want to focus on is a paper that, you know, the, the, the short titles we've been calling, we've been calling it the Permatrack paper, mm -hmm. right? And, and um, I'll let you go into the details of, of exactly how this worked. But to set things up, um, the idea in some sense is object permanence, right? You know, yeah. we as humans, we see a bicycle go behind a bus. And we know intuitively that bicycle is probably going to ride out from the other side of that bus. And, but machine learning models need to learn that. They need to be able to learn to predict and track objects through occlusions. Um, and we teach humans, babies learn how to do this at a young age, right? Now it's time to teach machine learning models to do the same. And your team was able to achieve some fantastic results in using synthetic data to track objects through these occlusions. Right. So, I'd love to hear maybe just first the setup for why is this important for autonomous vehicles to be able to perform this operation. Right. Then we'll go into details about how you did it. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. That's such a big, a big topic that we're very excited about. So that that work that you're mentioning, uh, learning to track with object permanence, uh, has been led by a researcher in my team called Pavel Tokmakov, mm -hmm. and together with uh, Jay Lee Wolfram and uh, Borgard and myself. And and really the idea was. It's really important when you, so tracking is a core perception problem for any robotic application. You need to know where objects are and how they move so that you can react to them, uh, at least avoid colliding into them. Uh, so, so for safety, tracking is one of the core computer vision uh, challenges that you see in any robotic stack. And so one of the big failure modes of tracking today is this robustness to occlusions that mm -hmm. you mentioned. So the fact that, I mean, people look very similar when it's like they're in front of the camera and et cetera, but when there can be like in a very busy street scene and they can be partially occluded by let's say a car or some like road furniture or something like that at a distance they look very different suddenly a human doesn't have legs anymore or or a human has only a left side and not mm -hmm. a right side exactly. and so for a computer vision system it's extremely hard to generalize to all these cases and now something even harder is when you know the peekaboo game i have a seven-year-old uh, daughter uh, called cassandra and i remember when she was like an infant we were playing the peekaboo game you know it's like suddenly daddy is gone and she cries <laughs> and now daddy is here mm -hmm. and now she's like oh daddy is back and it's really uh, funny how they quickly learn about this concept of object permanence you alluded to it which is a core concept that we develop very early on in life but current deep learning systems they don't know anything about object permanence. That's a big problem of deep learning right now, which is they lack some common sense that we have. So how do we teach that common sense? Can we learn it? And because obviously humans do learn it. You know, right. uh, my daughter at first she didn't know it. She acquired it very quickly. So can we get the same thing for deep learning models, for trackers to be robust? Um, and that's again key for self-driving applications because if a pedestrian is walking on the curb and is suddenly disappearing behind a parked car, the question is. Did that pedestrian enter the car, in which case I can go safely, or that this pedestrian just went behind the car and then maybe they're picking something up from the trunk, but maybe they're going to jaywalk mm -hmm. and they're crossing. You know, this happens every time, right? Like a crossing in between two cars and they're disappearing Absolutely. from your sight, you're slowing down. How do we get that common sense into cars, self-driving cars today? We don't know how to do that. Um, and simply because the trackers, for a tracker, it's like there's a pedestrian, there's no pedestrian. Yep. And, and that's a big, big danger. Um, and so the problem is when we teach machine learning models, as, as I mentioned earlier, it's supervised learning. So we manually label. We tell there's a person, there's a person, there's a person. There's no person anymore. That person is gone. Oh, wait, now there's a person again. It reappeared. And so we are teaching exactly the wrong thing to the deep learning model, which is there's someone, there's no there's one. No, exactly. And then somewhere, sometime in the future, oh, wait, it reappears again. And what we do in machine learning is just pattern recognition, right? The main conference in the field is called CDPR, computer vision and pattern recognition. That's what we do. There's no pattern there. We're confusing, we're basically injecting noise into the system. And that's where synthetic data is really kind of a game changer there because we know that there's a pedestrian there. We don't, we don't have to guess. Exactly. Uh, we know exactly where every object is in the world because it was generated by a simulator. So we're kind of in God mode. We know everything that happens everywhere. And so now we have access to this information. So now the core challenge for us in terms of 
um, the research was like, now we have access to this privileged information, how do we use it to train a model to be able to learn that there is something hidden there and you need to remember it and you need to track behind these occlusions even though there's nothing there. Apparently, this, the pixels that are there, that says car, it doesn't say person, right? And so we've been able, thanks to the parallel domain data, like to really experiment on how do we teach that model. So the first thing we tried was, let's just say, predict the accurate position of the pedestrian, irrespective of its visibility. So even if it's invisible, we know it's there, because from simulation, we know it's there. Um, so predict that location. But that also confused the model, because again, you're saying, hey, you see a car there, but it's not a car, it's a pedestrian. And then later you say, but that's a car. And then, oh, but that's a car and that's not a car? That's a so that's extremely confusing for the model. So what we did in this paper, Permatrack, is we really started to leverage this uh, synthetic ground truth, not directly as is, but as a way to compute our own ground truth on top of it. So for instance, uh, I was mentioning common sense. Here, what is the common sensey thing to do? The common sensey thing to do here is to say, well, that pedestrian, when it disappears, the best thing I can assume is that it's still there and probably it's moving at a constant velocity. Right. It might stop and turn around, right? And we have some examples of like the people walking behind a bus stop and then they stop because they're just waiting in the shade behind the bus stop. And of course, there's no way for you to predict that, so, but you need the model to predict something that there's still a pedestrian there. So the best case we do is say constant velocity, but constant velocity is not in the pixel space. Everything we do is from pixels and constant velocity in 2D. I mean, if you know a bit about 3D geometry, that's not constant velocity yeah, in 3D. That's not how perspective works. Yeah, that's not exactly. how perspective works. We know since uh, Da Vinci. Mm -hmm. so, so here, the challenge is get that ground truth from the synthetic data and then basically replace it after a bit of occlusion, right? So at first it's like, we, know, we see it, it's occluded. It was just fully occluded. So from that, we can have some momentum for the annotation and say, here, you should predict that there's uh, like the right location. And in between, predict me the default, the common sense thing of 3D constant velocity reprojected onto the frame. Mm -hmm. And that's only something we can do with synthetic data. I imagine that requires some pretty specific labels or accurate labels, both exactly. in terms of 3D bounding boxes and depth information and perfect pose information. Exactly. That's and very hard and that's the label. beauty is like, if you have an over complete set of labels, you can really find out the right way to distill them for mm -hmm. training uh, a model, which is exactly what we did. Um, and so, yeah, and so the results uh, in the end was that uh, we improved the state of the art for tracking because we increased the robustness. We've shown that it actually is capable of tracking much better behind uh, occlusions and especially long occlusions because we also did some deep learning engineering to basically use uh, uh, convolutional gated recurrent units. So like recurrent models that can track re like using the whole history because you need to remember it. So you need some form of memory. Um, and, um, and so we improve the state of the art, we improve the robustness. So it's not just accuracy, it's also safety uh, benefits that uh, directly resulted from combining, uh, of course, the synthetic data with real world data. So always mixing the two is, yeah. is the best of both worlds. Exactly, and, and I love that approach of, you know, when, when we talk about kind of touching on the earlier topic of, you know, how can machine learning teams use this today? It's that combination of really robust synthetic scenarios and labels with the real world data that you have actually allows you to train a model that now can go out into the real world and track these track through occlusions better, right? Yeah. And now we have a better chance of knowing when that pedestrian or bicyclist or other car is going to emerge. A question I had um, in the data itself, you know, let's say even if we could perfectly label mm -hmm. real world data, right? Mm -hmm. Which we can't do that right now. Um, are there things about these synthetic sequences that are valuable for you? And, and really the question is leading to, you know, how are we able to pack in, you know, more occlusions right. and more information and more interesting scenes that actually might have just taken a really long time to even find and collect in the yeah. real world, even if you could just, you know, assume the labeling problem was solved. Yeah. Um, is, is that a benefit that you're seeing with these synthetic sequences? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point. So we've iterated a lot on what scenes uh, we would generate mm -hmm. uh, from uh, Parallel Domain. And, and one in particular was we needed to see those long occlusions happen. Right. <laughs> because that's the whole thing is like machine learning is learning from experience. That's actually the original definition from the 50s. And, and if you're not experiencing long-term occlusions and complicated scenarios, there's nothing to learn. Even if you had the labels, even if you have like 
all the robotic fleets, etc. And so here again, it's the known unknowns. We're getting back to this, which is we know that we need some specific patterns of occlusions, like behind the bus stop, cars occluding each other, like dense traffic, buses and trucks that pass in front of you and like occlude a lot. And you don't want that to be like wiping a blank slate on your memory of your deep network. Exactly. So we've been generating scenes which are very challenging, um, especially for that. And it's actually really tricky to do in machine learning because you have this problem of machine learning assumes that you learn from data that is IID, which means independent uh, and uh, identically distributed. And if you are changing too much your data distribution at training time, you might actually make the model learn something that is not exactly like the real world. But at the same time, if you just learn from the real world distribution, you learn to drive straight <laughs> and that's it. And so the really cool thing with uh, synthetic data and the programmable nature of it is that we can find that sweet spot. What is the synthetic scenarios that correspond to maybe oversampling a little bit the hard parts of the real world while not at the same time making it really hard? It's, it's something called curriculum learning in machine learning. It's like how I teach my daughter math. Mm -hmm. uh, she's seven years old. I'm not starting with like quantum mechanics, you know? You start with the easy things first, but then gradually you need to be exposed to harder and harder things, maybe even harder things than what you would do day to day. As we all know in computer science, you know, sometimes uh, the day to day is a little bit of stack overflow and things that are easier <laughs> than the hardcore uh, CS that we've done sometimes in college. Right, and something that I love about being able to provide your team with programmable synthetic data sets is that you can iterate on those things like right. scene length and number of agents in a scene, how many pedestrians and buses and cars do we have packed in here? Are they five seconds long, 10 seconds long? Is this happening at daytime? Or iterate on sensors. Time? Iterate on sensors, right? That's exactly. uh, some hardware things that are very hard to modify in the real world because it takes a screwdriver and when you have like, <laughs> you know, 100 million cars on the road uh, like Toyota, you can't do that. Exactly. So yeah, you can, you can very easily change the world that's that's the that's the best thing exactly and tune up the data set you need then go train your models and like you said you can have these levels of progressing difficulty mm -hmm. which would actually be really hard to go out and curate all that data in the real world great so why don't we transition to talking about another paper that your team just recently mm -hmm. published affectionately called gouda mm -hmm. a geometric unsupervised domain adaptation for semantic segmentation uh -huh. that's a, a lot of words but yeah. uh, actually it's a, it's a very practical application in terms of using synthetic data to perform better domain adaptations so that we can yep. train better models so why don't um, why don't you just give a high level overview of what you did in the paper right. and then we'll go into some more details Right, so um, the first paper was really about multi-object tracking, so like detecting objects and how they move, etc. cetera. Um, this one is about semantic segmentation. And the idea of semantic segmentation is for every pixel, you want to know what type of object or, or type of scene element is it. Is it road pixel, is it the sky mm -hmm. pixel, is it the car pixel, etc. And so uh, as you can imagine, uh, labeling an image manually uh, like this, clicking on every pixel to tell what that pixel is, is something that can take hours, especially with the level of requirements we have in safety critical applications like self-driving cars. And when you have a very wide ontology, so a set of concepts, a set of objects or el scene elements that is very big. And so the key challenge here is how do you learn models uh, for semantic segmentation in a scalable way? And supervised learning is definitely not the way to go. But at the same time, self-supervised learning is kind of challenged there because this, I call this a face, but we could call it a schmerg. If all collectively in the world, we call this a schmerg, it's a schmerg. So people <laughs> impart semantics. It's, it's a people thing, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And so it's really hard to think in terms of like pure self-supervision. Like there's nothing in the signal that really tells you this is a face. So this is where, again, synthetic data is kind of the only way to go, I think, in my opinion, to really label at scale, like learn at scale, uh, very large like semantic segmentation uh, models. And, uh, but the challenge then becomes like, uh, I maybe learn only in the parallel domain uh, and uh, I need it to work in the real world, in the real domain. And so this problem of like, how do you work from simulation only and apply it in the real world is called the seam to real transfer. Mm -hmm. And so obviously as simulators get better and better, just training in simulation is, is getting to a really close level to like training in the real world with very expensive manually labeled uh, data sets. And we actually show this in the paper that, uh, you know, going from, you know, old school, like 2015, 2016 graphics to the latest and greatest like parallel domain photorealism yeah. actually boosts results quite a bit. And, and the comparison there, I believe, was with uh, Cynthia. Was it a Cynthia yep. data set to parallel domain? You were able to show the PD data. Exactly. Just by nature of it being higher fidelity, actually trained better models. Exactly. 
exactly exactly and that's one aspect that's very underexplored in machine learning mm -hmm. people talk about like scaling laws you know where you say how much better does your model get with the number of parameters and as you know right now it's the monster models especially language models but also computer vision based on transformers etc which are lots of parameters and that work better but also with data like so there's this two axes of like how much better it gets your, your model gets when it gets bigger and when it's fed more data mm -hmm. and very few people actually explore the question of the quality of the data because it's ill-defined it's not very well defined what data quality means but obviously garbage in garbage out there's actually a theorem in information theory called the data processing inequality that actually formalizes this and what we've shown in this paper is that for semantic segmentation training with higher quality data higher quality synthetic data actually can overcome the seem to real gap quite by quite a lot now um, how do we go even beyond that that's what this paper is about and this paper is about the seem to real domain adaptation and an unsupervised so this is what the uda unsupervised mm -hmm. domain adaptation really means what if i have some real world data like just videos not labeled. You don't ask any uh, human to you know, click on pixels, which even if you know we're using all of humanity to collectively click on pixels for Toyota, that would never be enough. So just have raw videos and then use fully labeled uh, synthetic data. And really the core innovation of um, that uh, paper is we leverage two things. One, synthetic data is fully labeled for a multitude of tasks. Right? Not just semantic segmentation, but it, again, because we're in God mode, we generate everything in the world, right? We know, uh, we get from basically the parallel domain uh, synthetic data, we get like flow, depth, surface normals, like all kinds of yeah. crazy things. And for folks listening, some of the, just to explain what some of those are, because I think, you know, we, we have our synthetic data speak, but, you know, optical flow is essentially a pixel wise indication of where everything, what velocity everything is moving in the scene. Uh, depth is a pixel wise mask of exactly how far away everything is, so we know exactly the exact depth of everything um, and you also mentioned you know uh, surface normals are a really interesting one because that actually tells us the shape of objects in the scene and the right. direction that those surfaces are facing and hey what's great for generating surface normals well synthetic data generators know the 3d shape of everything in yeah. order to render it right so these are natural labels that you can pull out and you were able to use to exactly exactly we had actually an earlier paper at iClear in 2019 uh, called SpyGAN uh, mm -hmm. so simulator privilege information GAN you guys have the best acronyms yeah, for your thank papers you. <laughs> <laughs> and so and so where we we basically were learning a generative adversarial network again mm -hmm. to kind of like make synthetic data look more more like the real world uh, and automatically learn that mapping uh, from pixels to pixels and what we found is that the most people just treat synthetic data as just images mm -hmm. but actually as you were saying you have a lot of internal data structures about the world that you know there is what we call this privileged information from the simulator and you can leverage that to help you guide the transfer from sim to real and so in this paper, Gouda, we've actually brought this even further because we're doing that we're doing multitask learning in the synthetic data domain, but we're combining it with real data where we're mixing it by using self-supervision in the real domain. And in particular, geometric supervision, that's why GUDA, mm -hmm. geometric unsupervised domain adaptation, where from synthetic data, you just say, predict all the labels that you get for all these different tasks, surface normals, depth, etc. And at the same time, mix it with a little bit of real world data where, or maybe a lot uh, that's unlabeled and where you pay a loss on the real world data that is uh, self-supervised for depth prediction. And that's a lot of the research in my team we've done, which is what's called also pseudo LIDAR, which is how do you get uh, from single images something like LIDAR outputs, mm -hmm. meaning 3D points in yeah, the world. Monocular depth estimation exactly. is another way to put that. And that's too. fully self-supervised, meaning that there's you can just learn from raw videos. Mm -hmm. And so we basically combine these two ideas of like learning from simulation with supervision, privileged supervision, multitask, and learning from real world data, fully self-supervised using geometry as a source of supervision. And, and really combining those two during training enables you to learn a unified model that is really good at semantic segmentation in the real world. Although it has never been told what a car is in the real world or what a person is in the real world. Yeah, and, and that's worth kind of doubling down on. So what you did here is you were able to take real world videos plus synthetic data from parallel domain and these kind of privileged labels, depth, surface normals, etc. And using those two things without having to label your real world data, you are now able to train a model that can semantically segment 
objects in the real world. Right, right? exactly. That, that's fascinating. And, and uh, the side benefit of that is because that model is learned jointly in synthetic data and the real world, but it's used for multiple tasks in synthetic worlds because we have this all this ground truth for these other mm -hmm. tasks. Mm -hmm. Actually, that model also works for these other tasks in the real world. Yeah. So what I love that in the paper. You have all these semantic yeah. segmentation results, which which we'll show here. But then also there was a, a hidden gem in there of depth, right? Beating the state yep. of the art on depth estimation, yep. which was something that just kind of fell out of the the results. Yeah, it's really it, cool. it's funny actually. When we were writing this paper, we were struggling with that a little bit to say we are setting uh, the story for like improving the state of the art on semantic segmentation from the seem to real setup mm -hmm. and <laughs> by accident we actually crushed the state of the art for depth <laughs> estimation at the same right. time um right. so yeah that's uh, that's uh th that's what's interesting about this paper there's also the scaling laws as i mentioned so i mentioned quality right which i think is really novel uh, very few people have studied that question and here improving the quality of the rendering it's it's a very concrete well-posed way of defining quality. Yeah, let's take a second to dig into that because you know, at Parallel Domain, we often talk about these two axes of data quality, yep. and one of those is fidelity, right? Yep. And that is is to say, how realistic yep. is the data that we are generating? How closely does that actually mimic physical phenomena in the real world? So photorealism for camera, or you know, physical accuracy in, in the LiDAR spectrum. But then there's another axis, which is your diversity and your scalability yep. of that data, right? And it's one thing to make the most photorealistic street corner in the world. It's another thing entirely to have 100,000 of those with all the different scenarios you might encounter. And so something I loved about Gouda here is it kind of showed that our data is able to make some of the most positive impacts you've seen in both of those axes, right? Exactly. Showed performance improve with by adding more PD data. You also showed that performance in the baseline was better against other synthetic data because the data was higher fidelity. Exactly. And maybe elaborate on that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, exactly. Actually, that's one of the other um, uh, kind of areas of simulation that keeps coming again and again and again, which is how photorealistic do you need to create the matrix? Do you need to have like the overcome the uncanny valley, etc. And so again, the answer is no, because if you combine with real world data, then mm -hmm. you don't need to have like like this, I think, unachievable dream of like the full matrix, right? right. Um, but this content realism that you're talking about, I think is really important. Actually, in 2016, I organized the first international workshop on, on this topic of simulation for deep learning. It's called VARVI, uh, Virtual and Augmented Reality for Visual AI. And here, my I had a talk that was called The Need for Sim. Mm -hmm. uh, which you play on word on the, on the game Need for Speed, um, and and so here. <laughs> which, by the way, some of our, our CTO James Grieve, that was a, a game that he worked on for a very long time, Need for Speed. So it's a <laughs> there you good go. Connection there. Um, and so and so in that talk, uh, Need for Sim, uh, what I was talking about was everybody's so focused on photorealism, but. Photorealism is making steady progress, and you can maybe take more time to render using mm -hmm. more, uh, you know, ray tracing, fancier things. And now you have like really a boost in terms of real time ray tracing, for instance, mm -hmm. that makes like tremendous progress in photorealism. But people are not really focused on content realism, and yeah. this is the aspect we were talking about earlier about programmable data. If your simulator is not able to just like repeat scenarios that like an artist or some engineer, simulation engineer codes. Um, that that's the key is like going beyond that and so procedural generation i think is really interesting because now you can have the engineer the machine learning engineer right pilots the data generation to say these are the distribution of things i want to see in the world and and then you can get to approach content realism um and that is what we also show in the paper like that that boosts also a lot the result and we're so happy that you were able to show that because you know one of the core tenets of for us as a company is that content realism, right? And how do you generate uh, high fidelity content? And this has to do with the street models, the cars, the buildings, the people yep. walking around, the, the signs and traffic lights, everything in that world. But not only being able to generate those things at a high level of high degree of realism, high level of fidelity, but also being able to generate that diversity in content right. is really important. And and I think folks who might not have had as much exposure to computer graphics might think, oh, oh you know, high fidelity synthetic data is just ray tracing, right? I just need to implement ray tracing and I'll have great synthetic data. That's just not the case, right? You know, there, we, we always used to use the old Grand Theft Auto analogy a lot in talking about uh, that's one of the larger cities built for a video game, very high fidelity. Um, you know, 
two thousand people worked on that game. Over over two hundred million dollars went yeah. into building that game. I like, think ten years later, it's still in the top three of the most expensive games ever, ever made, made. Right? Exactly. Right. And and a lot and most of that was dedicated to building the content. Right. And yep. being able to build uh, all these different you know, people and cars and cities um, within the game. So I, I love that you were able to touch on that because the procedural generation that we do at PD is really focused on helping solve that problem. And I think what you've been able to show, which is exciting, is that that actually then makes a difference. It translates yeah. to better performance in your machine learning models. And diversity, right? So so that's what we show also in, in, in the paper is that we improve with quality, but we also improve with quantity. Mm -hmm. And you only improve it with quantity if you have diversity. Exactly. It's the same thing as in the real world. You know, like we know diversity is important uh, for the gene pool, for everything, you know, mm -hmm. like companies and everything. Um, but it, here in machine learning, it's like something very, very tangible. It's not just a, a moral value. It's actually something you need. Right. Um, and, and again, the fact that you have so many knobs, this combinatorial explosion we're talking about, about the known unknowns, the fact that you have an API that's so powerful, you can freely cover whatever kind of combination you want, ensures that diversity scales with, with quantity. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's how we can find this like, very nice uh, scaling laws. Actually, what we found in the paper is that it was linearly improving with the quantity of data. And, and we found that it was only like, you only need like at, at mo at something like six times as much synthetic data compared to the real world data to start matching the mm -hmm. performance, which yep. we were very, honestly, I, I'm a big proponent of synthetic data. I was quite surprised by this. Yeah, and this it's great because the, the actually the unit economics then work out in favor of synthetic data, yep. right? You can actually get, you know, relative to the performance boost, more bang for your buck yeah. from using our synthetic data than you would if you were to take that out to the real world. I That's remember we were both very happy when yes. <laughs> we were talking about exactly. this Especially number. as somebody trying to build a business, that does make us happy. Um, and the and multiple customers now have, have been able to show this as well, where they've been able to take you know a, a portion of their training set and replace it with our synthetic data and get similar or even better performance. And that's they're able to now say, well, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50% of our training set now can start to be synthetic, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and being able to then combine the synthetic data and the real world data that they've already collected uh, is super powerful. I think that's a good segue into our vision for the future, right? Why is synthetic data um, the future of machine learning and, and what does the world look like two or three years from now as we're starting to scale up our use for synthetic data. You know, I've got some comments on that, but I know this is something that you think about quite often um, in terms of how do we actually change the way that we think about data? How do we change the way we're iterating on machine learning models um, as we head into the future? And maybe let's start near term. You know, what can people be doing today and tomorrow with synthetic data? But then let's transition into what happens with things like um, uh, generating data at training time, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on that. Yeah, so that's something I've been um, uh, thinking about a lot. Something I've been saying for quite a while is that um, I want all my manual labeling budget to go to my test set mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. as little as possible to my training data. So of course, some of it needs to go to the training data, but I want to have as little manual labeling required for training on real world data. It's like, because you don't want to be babysitting. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is how we learn as humans, right? We learn with very few examples. It's like we don't repeat things again and again and again and again and again a million times. So we want to get to the same situation, which means how do we limit the supervision, the real world supervision? Mm -hmm. And so one of the things we've been doing a lot is self-supervised learning. So use all the real world data. Some of it is labeled. Uh, we call this few shot learning. And a lot of it is unlabeled. And we use self-supervised learning for that. Um, and it's also a problem known as semi-supervised learning. Uh, and that's what we do with the real-world data. But obviously, uh, there's no free lunch. If you just do that right now, it's not working as well as labeling everything. So we, that's where synthetic data comes into play, because here we can generate much more, um, mm -hmm. and it's fully labeled. So again, for me, the ideal situation is I bootstrap from 0 to 1 with only synthetic data. And then once I have a first model that's there, I can start maybe reach some level of base level of KPI with only synthetic data, right? Key performance indicators. Mm -hmm. And then I can start like deploying that model, maybe just in ghost mode, maybe just to start to get like some like of that model running and making mistakes, harmless mistakes because it runs in ghost mode. Right. And it tells and you just for people watching ghost mode would really mean that the model is running on the sensors and hardware of the vehicle, but it's not actually impacting the decisions the vehicle is making. It's just learning and collecting. Data. Exactly. You can do that even like not live. You can do that 
purely historical data. You reprocess mm -hmm. historical data and you run this model and you start to look uh, what's called active learning. Where does it make mistakes? Where is it uncertain? Mm -hmm. And then you start to kind of like gradually route some of that data, the most important real world data uh, into labeling and then gradually starts to mix put more in your like your energy mix you know like you mm -hmm. put your your real world and synthetic mix you you just infuse a little bit of real world uh, labels but that active learning process can also be done on synthetic data right because you can know oh it seems like it's making more mistakes on ambulances can i get more ambulances and and that can be even fully automated uh, this was a, a, a great result we had shown with um, uh, some of your, your sibling teams over at, at the Woven Group, um, where they were able to train models that better detect emergency vehicles, right? And that's exactly. based on feedback that, hey, the model isn't doing well here. And because the data is programmable with the API, exactly. like you mentioned, let's get more of that. Let's get more of the data where things are hard. Let's look at, you can even watch gradient descent as it's happening, right? And where are we seeing the biggest gradient? So where do we need more data that's right. like this other thing? Uh, and that actually allows you to, like you said, go zero to one with synthetic data, get a model up and running, and then actually start learning from where it's weak. Exactly. And, and then start combining both real and synthetic data together to combat those right. weaknesses. And, and and so active learning, right? It, it's When you start, you're very uncertain, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why if you bootstrap from zero to one, when you set a high baseline from simulation only, you're gonna be directly optimizing your active learning loop, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's not gonna be saying like, I don't know, everything is uncertain. You've given it some initial direction yeah. at least. And it's, 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 it's actually semi-smart, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's gonna be focusing uh, on things that are meaningful and helpful to learn. And eventually, uh, we're gonna be able to transition to something that is a machine learning dream, which is lifelong learning. Mm -hmm. It's funny, like if I talk to, if you talk to people, like I, I talk to my grandma, for instance, uh, explaining her uh, what machine learning is. And, and what's very funny is that consistently, people think machine learning is a machine that is learning. It is not. Today, machine learning is a machine that is learned and then shipped mm -hmm. and then makes predictions. Right. But it's typically not, like for most machine learning systems in production today, it is not constantly adapting at the edge. There are some like federated learning mechanisms, etc., to do that. But it, it's actually like very, very, very little of today's machine learning in production, and it's actually an open research challenge. How do you handle, you know, distribution shifts? Your input changes, like if you go from summer to winter, uh, or your sensor position changes a bit. Like so, you have so many. We're back to the world is non-stationary. So many things that change that it's like machine learning engineers are basically running after the world, like deploying a system. By the time it's learned and they deploy it, it's almost outdated, and then right. they have this race right. against the clock to update it. And you run into these problems like model drift and, and maintenance, where you yep. know once that model is deployed, it's almost yeah, like you said, almost out of date by the time it gets deployed let alone, you know, right. years later when you, ideally, I imagine, you know, Toyota someday will be wanting to be learning from these vehicles operating and then providing over the air updates right. so the, the systems actually just get better as they're driving. So how do you do that? How do you make the system really autonomous? Like that's mm -hmm. one of the core research problem that we have, which is autonomy. And autonomy doesn't mean just we learned a model and we shipped it right. and then we forget about it. Yeah, it's autonomous, but it's unsafe it's bad it's gonna break and so at at toyota we're very conscious about safety so we're mm -hmm. thinking about these things very very seriously and that's why also we have this longer term view things like lifelong learning which also self-supervised learning can enable because if you're self-supervised then you can compute the objective at runtime right so you can constantly update from the raw signal itself and and so lifelong learning is all about like closing this loop in real time, this learning loop in real time and have machines that learn, not machines that are learned. And synthetic data can be there too because you can close that loop not just by doing it at the edge, but by going back, not sharing data. You don't even need to share data. You just need to basically like um, ping the API, the synthetic mm -hmm. data API to say, I need more of that. Right. I know from my local exactly. computation, which I'm not gonna share with you, that just give me more of that. I encountered something hard. I don't know what that was. Give me more of that, right? Yep. And I think that's a perfect example of where we'd love to head with, with active learning and, and the synthetic APIs. Because we're using procedural generation and we have an ability to generate scenes and scenarios that actually mimic what you're encountering without any human intervention, you can actually ask for more of the same but with different lighting, but with yeah. cars in different places, but with a slightly different road. So you have enough examples of an occurrence that you encountered to actually learn in a generalizable way from that occurrence. Right. Right? And I think for like, like really very large scale customer facing applications, like this is why I'm also a big believer in synthetic data, not just because it works or because mm -hmm. it has a lot of interesting research challenges, but because it's a way to escape the surveillance economy too. 
Uh, machine learning is all about learning from data. And so if you imagine like learning at a very large scale, you have to share all this data. You have to do, I, I don't want to share all that data and nobody really wants to do that. With synthetic data, you, you can basically alleviate all these privacy concerns and yet retain the data-driven benefits of right. machine learning. Right. Yeah, and we see that very often with, especially in data that has to do with personally identifiable information and any customers that need to be near or interact with humans, it becomes very difficult all of a sudden to even use real-world data for some of those applications. Yep. So it's, a, it's another great use case for synthetic. Well, um, I appreciate you sharing the vision that you have here for the future. I think it aligns very well with where we'd like to see synthetic data in the machine le learning world go. I'd like to thank you for joining us in between our two synthetic ferns. It's been great <laughs> chatting with you. I'm sure we'll do more of these in the future, but thank you very much. It was a pleasure, Zach. Oh, sorry, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye.